Please join us in welcoming Mark Schultz, Commissioner, Rehabilitation Services Administration, delegated the duties of Assistant Secretary for Special Education and Rehabilitation Services. Prior to joining us at the U.S. Department of Education, Mark served as both the Director and Associate Director with Nebraska Vocational Rehabilitation. Mark has also served as President of the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation and a member of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Information Technology Steering Committee. Please welcome Mark Schultz. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here with you all this afternoon and to, um, as a part of your Disability Employment Summit and to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA. And as many of you may know, it's also the 100th anniversary of the VR program. So I'm very excited about that. It's truly a milestone moment for VR programs across the country. I might also mention, because I wear another hat as well, that it's the 45th anniversary of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act as well. So um, many anniversaries to celebrate in 2020, um, as well as we've had many surprises in 2020. And I, I think I probably should have had an indication that this is going to be a year filled with surprises because of the way I started this position. Um, when I was first nominated for the position, I, of course, was very excited about it. And I was looking through our local newspaper to see if there was an announcement. And uh, of course, it wasn't on the first page. Um, but as I was going through the newspaper, I finally found the article with a picture of myself uh, sharing that I had been nominated for the commissioner position. Um, then I fully opened the paper and realized there were lots of pictures and lots of little stories about people on this page because it was the obituary section in the paper. Um, so that should have been an indication this was not going to be a usual um, term for me and that there were going to be many surprises. Um, and so once you've seen your picture on the obituary page, um, challenges don't bother me because I'm just grateful for each extra day that I have. Um, so I'm especially grateful for this opportunity to be able to share a few words about VR 100, but the work that we're doing at RSA to support your work uh, in helping individuals achieve their goal of competitive integrated employment. I would also share that I have spent some time with several members of the Alabama uh, DRS team when I was working on a grant project in collaboration with them uh, in one other state. And, and just hanging out with them at conferences. And I've always been impressed with the quality of their character, their commitment, and their dedication to the work of the VR program. So I've had a very positive experience already uh, associated with your workforce development system in Alabama. So it was 100 years ago that Woodrow Wilson first signed into law the Smith Best Act, creating a civilian vocational rehabilitation program. And that laid the groundwork for the program as we know it today. Throughout the program's 100 year existence, the VR program has continually adapted and evolved to meet the changing public needs and circumstances, all with an unwavering commitment to the individuals with disabilities that we serve. That evolution has seen the program start out by primarily serving individuals with physical disabilities to one where we now serve individuals with all disabilities. It has moved from a program employing a medical model of service to one of inclusion and informed choice by individuals with disabilities as they pursue employment and independence. The program has evolved to have a dual customer focus by recognizing the opportunity to serve employers, to connect them to a trained, qualified workforce, and through those connections, create additional opportunities for career pathways, work experience, opportunities um, for internships and apprenticeships. The program has evolved to recognize the critical importance of working with students with disabilities, to provide pre-employment transition services, to create expectations that everyone can work, and to at an earlier age, empower those students with the knowledge, skills, and experience to make informed decisions about the pursuit of their career choices. Most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly challenged VR programs, but has challenged all of us, many of you out there, this virtual celebration is a great example of how we've all had to adapt. Due to COVID-19, VR programs have had to empower individuals with disabilities in a different manner. 
you've had to rethink how to best serve students and adults across the country and in, um, in also in Alabama, uh, as well as the programs across the country. You've had to be creative and innovative in how you've delivered those services that are needed now more than ever to take advantage of the job opportunities that exist and to help individuals keep the jobs that they already have. You have found ways to continue providing services throughout this pandemic, whether that be through virtual or in person services. Um, and as I understand it, other than a six week mandatory shutdown, your offices have remained open as you've worked to provide some continuity of services. So I applaud you for that. Um, while I've been away from some of the details of the work, as I mentioned, I had some earlier collaboration with the Alabama DRS program, and I was always very impressed with the work that you were doing under the data dashboard. So I applaud you for that and the transparency that you've created through that system. But you've particularly worked to develop partnerships and collaborations across your workforce system. So for example, some of the things that I'm aware of that you're doing there in Alabama is your work to continue to focus on services for individuals with mental health issues through the use of peer support specialists in a partnership with the Department of Mental Health. I'm also very excited about your state as a model employer initiative that would create a state level work opportunity tax credit. And I applaud you for the work you're doing with the promoting opportunities with Social Security Administration. I think as you'll hear as I talk about this a little more, benefits counseling is a critical factor making informed choices, uh, particularly when we talk about quality employment and opportunities for advancement. There are a lot of complicated decisions and factors that come into play, and that support is going to be very crucial in that process. So it's clear that your work didn't stop with the onset of the pandemic. And I thank you for your efforts to assure continuity of services during these trying times. But let me assure you that the work at RSA hasn't stopped either. We continue to do what we can to support the work of the state agencies across the country. So at the federal level, um, the core agencies have continued to meet on a monthly basis, those core partners under WIOA, so that we can discuss our initiatives, but also share how we might better work together to support the work that you're do doing there within your state and the workforce development system. But I wanna specifically talk about some of the things we are doing now at RSA to support our VR programs as a core partner in this system. So over the, the last 100 years, uh, our history has been full of many challenges. And many of you know that we've been working at rethinking VR performance over the last year. So I'd like to share a little bit about what we're doing and perhaps how some of that is connected to your role as a workforce um, partner. So we established a performance data work group that is uh, comprised of RSA, the representative state VR agencies, the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation, and the National Council um, for um, Administrators for Blind Agencies, NCSAB, to create a shared vision of VR program success and making sure that VR agencies will have the tools that will assist them with data analysis and program evaluation. So the goal is to identify what does a successful VR program look like and how can we better demonstrate that with the performance measures and the data that we are collecting. And I think that will also help inform our partners under the workforce development system so that they have a true picture of the value and the benefit of the VR programs um, as a part of workforce development. And that will help us better align the work that we're doing as core partners across the entire system. So one of my priorities coming in, and I think for all of us, um, is to take a look at how we might be able to support your work through providing more flexibility and perhaps reducing the burden of some of the, um, the policies and processes that have been put into place. And I'd really like to, to talk about the work there under the pre-employment transition uh, services that are being provided. One of the first things we did was look at the impact that that 15% mandatory set aside of federal funds for VR programs for the provision of those services to look at the impact that was having. Um, and we understood that by the narrow interpretation of what might be an eligible expenditure, we were further in, impacting the adult system because that allowed for fewer resources as you had to meet the requirements under the 15% set aside. 
So we provided some more flexibility with a notice of interpretation, looking at those kinds of services that would help prepare students for the workforce um, under the pre-employment transition services, but also you need to get there. So what are the supportive services, the transportation, the uniforms, et cetera, that are required to participate in the activities for pre-employment transition? And so allowing those will hopefully allow more students to get into pre-employment transition services and take advantage of things like work-based learning, the job exploration counseling, the independent living and advocacy skills training, and the um, connecting and counseling on post-secondary um, and training opportunities for students. So looking at those services and really truly supporting students um, so that they can have access to those services, but also begin that process of careers and looking at uh, making informed decisions about where they want to pursue um, their uh, future careers as well. So we've also worked very closely with the Department of Labor in providing joint guidance on things such as negotiations and sanctions, um, which will have a future impact in terms of the benchmarks, how we look at that performance, and then how do we get to where we want to be? And so we, we put out joint guidance to all our workforce partners around that issue. But I think most importantly, um, because of COVID-19 pandemic and the unexpected onset of that, we've had to look at how we can continue services and looking at where we might have some flexibility to do that in looking at the impact of COVID. So we issued um, almost immediately in April and March uh, several frequently asked question documents that helped the VR programs look at the allowable flexibilities as related to fiscal management and administration of the program so that you could continue to provide support and, can, and provide continuity of operations to individuals with disabilities. And just a few weeks ago, we issued an additional FAQ document that addresses additional questions around the provision of services and the use of VR funds for specific activities, including the provision of uh, personal protective equipment for the individuals that you're serving, as well as for staff. We've also done a number of things around technical assistance, and in particular in response to COVID. Um, we immediately worked with WINTAC, the Technical Assistance Center for VR programs, to expand their capacity to provide information on the best practices and strategies that support the move to telework and the provision of remote services. So we could have that continuity of services. And I would say in our follow-up with those state agencies, we've seen many models, whether it be all in-person, a hybrid model um, that includes some provision of remote services or completely 100% virtual. Um, it's important to know what the best practices are around each of those models to do the best that we can to continue to provide services. One of the other things that we did was to issue a joint letter so that um, a joint letter between the Office of Special Education Programs and the Rehabilitation Services Administration on the importance of collaboration, particularly between VR agencies and schools, because that's where we need to start. There's a, there's a strong connection between education and employment. And in education, they create the foundation for the work that goes on, that transition to employment later on that foundation that looks at involvement of individuals within the decision-making process. We have involvement of parents and students within the development of the individualized education program. We have informed choice and involvement of the individual in the planning process around the individualized plan for employment in the VR system. Uh, we both have evaluation components um, and those planning components. They're so critical to decision-making. So, to have that collaboration across those systems is important for all students and youth as they then transition to the adult systems and particularly workforce development so that they're ready and can advance more quickly to pursuing that career pathway. We've also looked at our technical assistance centers and while we were working with WinTAC and they had the primary responsibility to support the movement of VR systems into implementing what was required under WIOA, uh, we've taken a different look at that now, and uh, we've implemented systems, right? And we're in the, that process. What we really want to now do fo is focus on the quality of our programs across the country and the quality of the services. So we've established several TA centers that will help us do that. First of all, we have the National uh, 
Technical Assistance Center for Transition, or NTAC, which is supporting that work, that early work that we're doing around pre-employment transition and transition to help focus on those career pathways. And particularly, we're, help, we're starting to emphasize the um, uh, career education component in the connection there back to um, career pathways, apprenticeships, and interns, internships under that technical assistance. Um, and then for the adult system, really looking at quality employment. What is a quality employment service? What does that look like? What are the kinds of strategies and interventions that might be provided that take us to the next level? Um, in order to get there, you have to be making good decisions about those practices. So well, having a technical assistance center then on quality of management allows us to look at those successful evidence-based strategies and services that lead to better paying jobs and career pathways, and then to have leadership and decision makers have the knowledge, the data, and understanding to make good choices about the programmatic and fiscal decisions that lead us to then implementing those quality practices. So those TA centers are going to be providing intensive TA support to states so that they can continue to lead to quality employment for individuals with disabilities. That will then have a direct connection to the monitoring that we will be doing as we look at some of the issues that states are facing and, and then doing it in a more supportive fashion so that our technical assistance leads to quality improvement. So we'll be making connections back to those technical assistance centers that we've established um, so that they can focus on the identification of the strengths and areas needing improvement um, to establish quality services in those overall quality programs. So I think enhancing that communication will make us more effective in the work that we're doing. And speaking of communication, one of my priorities when I came into this job was to really elevate the program, the VR program, and raise the visibility of the VR program, and, and particularly through um, 100th anniversary celebrations. As I said, this was 2020 presented a primary opportunity for us to be able to do that. And so we did several things in regards to making people aware of VR program, not just the, our partners, but also the individuals that need those services. So first of all, we need to be able to identify who a VR program uh, was because you all go by different names in different states. And so having a logo, a VR 100 anniversary logo that can be used for our communication, whether it be in email uh, signature lines or whether it, materials that we develop, it connects all of us as a unified program across the country, connects us all into this 100th anniversary celebration. Um, so, um, you know, very glad to see that many states grabbed onto that and are using that, and that, that connects us nationally. We also established a website for materials and events and success stories. And success stories are particularly critical in getting the word out, out about the VR program, what we can do, but also the impact that we have on the lives of individuals with disabilities, and that we're looking to really promote quality employment for those individuals. So obviously we needed to alter our plans a little bit in terms of how we were gonna communicate that message and ele elevate the program, because we really had a number of planned activities uh, for 2020, that we're going to be coming out to states and celebrating with you, as well as national events. And when we lost the opportunity to do a lot of those in person, uh, we had to change course. We had to then alter to conduct our programs in a virtual environment. So we've had a lot of monthly webinars and we built those webinars around key themes um, of the VR program and the services that are provided. So themes such as transition, innovative solutions to ensure the continuity of services during um, this time of COVID. Um, we focus on assistive technology solutions, veteran services, independent living and our partnerships with um, centers for independent living, uh, as well as other key themes. And then um, we, by communication, we also have worked with our core partners, as I've mentioned in our monthly meetings, um, where we focused on making sure that VR has a seat at the table on the state workforce development boards. As we were looking at some of the state plans, we saw that perhaps wasn't happening. And so we've reached back and, and really tried to um, 
enforce that requirement that BR be a part of the discussions and be at the table because it's so important to have the voice of someone representing individuals with disabilities as we talk about our entire workforce system. It's a key element of that workforce development system. So uh, we're, we were, um, that's one of the areas of communication that we particularly focused on with our, our partners. But 2020 is coming to an end, the celebrations are coming to an end, and we need to look to the future so that we're continuing to stay relevant in this changing environment. And so uh, WIOA requires uh, movement away from seclusion and sub-minimum wage jobs to one of competitive integrated employment and inclusion and one of quality employment. So let me talk about a few of the, the key issues that I see in the future of our workforce system and for VR. So one immediate issue is the need for additional guidance on competitive integrated employment. And so I think you've probably talked about it at the state level, the local level, it's been a key issue at the national level. Um, and we were making some progress. We were meeting with stakeholders, starting to move that discussion forward to come, um, come up with areas where it, which needed clarification and then to develop that clarification. Um, but COVID unfortunately impacted on the timeline for that process. Um, but I've continued to meet with, and I continue to hear from stakeholders on this issue, even during this time. Um, and one of the things I wanna share with you all is that there is a lot of common out, commonality, even though we have some differences. Uh, so the commonality is that we all value employment for people with disabilities, that we all want to maximize the potential of individuals with disabilities, and that we believe that informed choice of individuals is paramount to this process. What we don't necessarily agree on is that when you make an informed choice, there is a potential consequence to that choice. And one of the, one of the consequences is perhaps the VR funds don't follow along in support of an individual who chooses to stay or go to work in a sub-minimum wage job that's not integrated. So we do continue to stress that VR programs need to make these decisions about whether or not a site is competitive integrated employment on a case-by-case case, uh, case by case basis. And that if an individual chooses a goal other than competitive integrated employment, that they need to be referred to the appropriate services and the providers based on their decisions. So I just want you to know, I understand that there is a need for clarity on these issues. And our hope is to provide that clarity very, very soon. And we continue to work on that. There's also um, very much a need for us to continue to look at the impact that WIA has had on the VR program and on our services. Um, there's much to consider as we've documented within our report to Congress that was required to, to share with them what the impact of WIA has been and what we're seeing in regards to our data. So we've reported a number of things that I just wanna to touch base on very quickly and some of the things that we're seeing, not to scare you, but to talk about the challenges, right? And the opportunities that exist. So if we look at the number of applicants for the VR program, there's been a, a tremendous shift. So if we look at where we were 10 years ago in 2010, we had over 700,000 applicants coming in that needed our services or wanted VR services. And just this last year, we reported that 361,000 applicants came into the program. Um, so that's a significant drop. That's more than a 50% decrease in terms of the number of individuals that we're serving. We saw the same trend in the number of individuals eligible going from 693,000 to this last program year, 338,000. So I think we were starting to see the impact of COVID as well as the impact of those things such as pre-employment transition services, the focus on helping individuals move to sub uh, move out of subminimum wage jobs into competitive integrated employment. Those impacted on your ability to serve adults with disabilities to achieve successful employment outcomes. Um, so let's talk about the pre-employment transition service numbers because clearly um, what's happening there, if in fact, with the adult service system, we're seeing a decrease. So for pre-employment transition services, we've only been have data for the last couple of years, but in program year 2017, we were serving 525,000 students with disabilities 
And just last year, it went up to 682,000 students with disabilities. So that's, that's a fairly significant increase. That's 150,000 additional students that are being served. But when we look at the, the number of services provided to those students, it's even more telling, I believe. In 2017, we provided 747,000 pre-employment transition services to students with disabilities. Just this last year, it went up to 1.3 million pre-employment transition services. That's almost a doubling. So the other thing that we see in the trend and in, in the data is the age of the individuals we're serving has had a drastic change. For those of you that continue to think of the VR programs as an adult program, um, this will change your mind. 51% um, of the individuals now being served by the VR programs across the country are individuals who are 24 years of age or younger. That has tremendous implications for moving forward in terms of what we do. Um, that has had an impact on the funds for other individuals and has caused more than half of our VR programs to move into what's called an order of selection. So that means that they keep a waiting list of individuals because they can't serve everyone that comes into the system. So for certain categories, those individuals have to wait. Eight states have closed all those categories and are only serving individuals with an open case right now. So on the plus side, um, while we aren't able to serve everyone, we've seen the VR programs really becoming a better partner in the workforce system as this forces them to collaborate and to refer individuals to our other partners and to work together to assure at least some services can be provided until the specialized services under VR can be provided to those individuals that are on the wait list. So as we look to the near future, some critical decisions need to be made about the direction of the VR program. So we're gonna to need to be prepared to provide input and recommendations when the reauthorization of the Rehab Act begins to move forward. So I just wanna to touch on one other future issue and then I will close. But um, one of the expectations that I think that we really need to focus on is that of quality employment outcomes. The opportunity comes through the creation of our partnerships with businesses as we build career pathways through certificate programs or internships and apprenticeships. And by focusing on quality employment, we can help individuals achieve economic self-sufficiency through advancement. And so what we're seeing right now in the data is that currently 55% of the individuals in the VR programs across the country are closed with jobs that are paying $12 an hour or less. And so when you consider that around, depending on the state and the size of the family, that $12 an hour is about 130 to 150% of the federal poverty level. So if we talk about moving individuals to economic self-sufficiency, we need to do better. So while there are challenges, there are also opportunities, I believe. And we have a long history in which we can draw from as we move forward into the next 100 years. So we honor our past through these kinds of celebrations, but we also must take what we've learned and continue to shape the VR program, its services and its supports to keep pace in, with the changes of today and tomorrow. And so we, we have a lot of history and we build off the great work of those who came before us. More employers are seeing that remote services and telework are viable options for their employees. This creates an opportunity for greater flexibility in accommodating schedules, job duties, and options for individuals with disabilities. So VR programs need to once again evolve to incorporate training, skills, and supports, such as assistive technology, to accommodate those changes that we will see in the jobs of today, but also to prepare for the jobs of tomorrow. So as we continue to evolve, one thing I hope never changes through the next 100 years is the basic pur purpose of the VR program, to help students, youth, and adults with disabilities achieve high quality employment outcomes, high quality employment outcomes that they choose and which allow them to reach to their extent that they desire, their highest career goals, and their fullest potential. So I wish you all a joyous and well-earned celebration of the VR, VR 100 years but also the ADA 30 year celebration as well. So here's to many more successes in Alabama as we move ahead into the next 30 years for ADA, but also the next 100 years for the VR program. So thank you for being a part of the summit today.